Welcome back, PM Peeps, to PM Corner. As you can see, we're going to talk about another subject today regarding project management. But before we begin, if you like the content that you're watching slash listening to, you can subscribe to us on YouTube and or Spotify to get all the different episodes, including new releases. If you also want to keep in touch in terms of understanding when videos are going to be released, when the Spotify podcasts are going to be released, you can follow and us. Now on you're probably wondering, PM peeps, what are we going to talk about today? For those of you that can watch on YouTube, you see what the question is on the screen. For those of you listening on Spotify, the first thing we're going to talk about is what is project management? Now, I know we've gone over, in a simplistic view, what project management is, which is really covering all the processes, really. And yes, we've talked about a lot of projects, but we never really sat down and really discussed what is project management. So per the PMBOK, the definition of a project is a temporary endeavor with a defined beginning and end that creates a product, service, and or result. And so with project management, we have to say, okay, well, based on that definition, what does project management have to do with what a project is? Well, project management is taking that definition and turning it into a science and an art form. And as I say to my clients and even to my students all the time, project management is exactly that. It is a science. It is an art. And why is it a science and an art? Well, from a scientific perspective, is a systematic process of managing work efficiently and effectively. This is where we talk about those processes, right? Like integration management, scope, cost, um, schedule, you name it. This also means we talk about the different types of projects, right? Like hybrid, agile, and of course, my least favorite to call it, but it is what it is, traditional project management. Because scientifically, we have to understand how we're going to manage the project. We have to understand how we're going to make the work flow in a way that meets timely deadlines, meets clients' expectations, and of course fulfills the business value of that project in the first place. And at the same time, it is an art because as a project manager, you're not only an integrator, which we're going to get into next, but you're also the type that has to use various skills, such as influencing, leadership, that's mentioned in resource management chapter, organization, and strategy. Now, I always emphasize, particularly with scheduling, that we need to utilize these different processes skillfully and strategically. And why is that? Because we as project managers need to be able to meet, again, the business value of a project. You're not going to be able to do that just following a checklist. I don't care what anyone tells you. You're not going to have a perfect checklist of how everything's going to get done, when it's going to get done, who you need, when you need them, all that. And this is where you have to be very innovative, artful about your project. And especially when you break it down to the process groups. Now that we've talked about what is project management, the next question we need to ask ourselves is what is a project manager? Now, as discussed earlier, you as a project manager are an integrator. And what do we mean by that? Well, according to the integration management chapter, the project manager is an integrator because you break all the different processes, tools and techniques. Um, if you're kind of more a little old school when it comes to the PMBOK, the ITTOs, right? Um, you are bringing them all together to work as a cohesive whole to get the project moving and working and creating that business value. The other thing about project manager is as you're integrating all the different processes, tools, and et cetera, you are also meeting objectives and again, delivering the business value. But in addition to that, you are also kind of the face of the project when it comes to your team. Why? 
because you are the one that's going to discuss and communicate and collaborate and maybe even have to deliver bad news to your client. And your client is always going to be dealing with you. Yeah, they may talk to an engineer, a team lead, your master scheduler, here and there, or a little more frequently, depending. But 100% of the time, you're the one they're going to. And that's why a project manager is essential to a project, because without a project manager, people just tend to kind of do their own thing, and then it becomes a Lord of the Fly situation. Not that extreme to that degree, but it becomes a Lord of the Fly situation, right? You get with some people that want to follow one person, you get other people that want to follow a different person. So that's why the project manager is the integrator of all this information. So now our next subject, since we've talked about what is a project, what is project management, and what is a project manager, we're also going to talk about schedule management really briefly. And this piece will afterwards introduce the first part of this video podcast in our subject today. So, of course, when we're talking about schedule management, we're talking about a process, right? So the process in itself is to plan schedule management, define the activities, sequence the activities, estimate activity duration, develop the schedule, and monitor and control the schedule. And this is very important when it comes to creating your schedule, or in the real world, we also say an integrated master schedule, in understanding how you're going to complete the activities you need to do to fulfill the business value. And as part of that, there is a thing called a Gantt chart. Now, as you see on the screen, and you'll see it, but for those of you that are just listening on the podcast, what a Gantt chart is, it's like a visual uh, bar chart. So if you think of some of those um, data bar charts where they're coming from the side from the y-axis or the x-axis, no, 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 the y-axis, sorry, then the x-axis, that's what a Gantt chart is kind of similar to. But instead, it's broken down in a way of looking at time phasing your activities. Now, some Gantt charts can vary. It depends, of course, on the tool you use, right? So like Microsoft Project is pretty similar to, for those of you that can see on the screen, um, you, you see what I'm talking about. But for those of you on the podcast, um, where it lists on the left-hand side the name of the activity, and then on the right hand side is all the little bars, it's all the little um, indications of like what's a summary, what's a task, what's a milestone, what are the relationships with like little arrows and such. And it's a very pretty picture to show eh, maybe your upper management who's not necessarily involved in the day to day activities of your team. Whereas your team would probably look at the more of the detailed piece of the schedule, right? They want to look at the actual individual activities so that they know like where is what and adjust the relationships as necessary, a duration and so forth. But the Gantt is kind of more of a visual representation to help management, especially those that are not involved on the day-to-day, -day, understand what is going on with the project. And of course, it's really great in giving that understanding as well as kind of showing, depending, of course, on how you set it up, right? So in Microsoft Project, for example, you can break it down by quarters, like quarters within a year and months or weeks and days. It just depends on how you want to present that information. In the graphic here that I'm showing, you see it's kind of broken down by the weeks and then it's got the days of the week underneath. So you can time phase it like that. You can do it in other ways. It just depends. Now, I'm sure you're all probably wondering, what are we really talking about then? Because we went from understanding definitions to now a specific process and a particular result in a sense. Well, today we're going to talk about two different topics. They're not necessarily different, but one is more specifically about a person and the other is about 
project management as a whole. So as I mentioned, we are talking about a person and the history of project management. But what better way to lead into the history of project management by talking about the very individual who invented, you guessed it, Gantt charts. If you couldn't tell by the name on the screen, this person we're going to talk about, now mentioning for those listening on the podcast, Henry Gantt. So it is here as an introduction that Henry Lawrence Gantt, born May 20th, 1861, and passed away November 23rd, 1919, was an American mechanical engineer and management consultant who is best known for his work in development of scientific management. And of course, he created the Gantt chart in the 1910s. And he is also known as the father of planning and control techniques. Now, this guy was interesting to see along with another guy. Um, I will say there wasn't a whole lot about his early life. Nothing too impressive, I guess, is the word. Or interesting, really. Not impressive, just interesting. Um, but his career and his contributions to project management is... There is another person, as I said, who contributed to the scientific um, management. So I will have to look into that, and that might be a potentially another video podcast, but we'll see. But to look at his career and contributions in project management, in 1884, Gantt began working as a draftsman in the iron foundry and machine shop Pool and Hunt in Baltimore. And in 1887, he joined Frederick W. Taylor in applying scientific management principles to the work of Midvale Steel and Bethlehem Steel, working there with Taylor until 1893. And I think this guy might, this uh, Frederick W. Taylor might be it, but don't quote me on that. I have to look into it. I didn't research that much into scientific management. But of course, in Gantt's later career as an industrial consultant and following the invention of the Gantt chart, he designed the task and bonus system of wage payment and additional measurement methods to increase worker efficiency and productivity. And in 1908 through 1909, he undertook projects at Joseph Bancroft and Sons Company and Williams and Wilkins. And in 1916, he was influenced by Thorsten Velben Gantt set up the new machine. An association sought to apply the criteria of industrial efficiency to political process. And of course, he was uh, with this, the uh, Marxist Walter Polokov. He led a break away from the 1916 ASME conference to call for socializing industrial production under the controls of managers incorporating Polakov's analysis of inefficiency in industrial context, um, which was pretty interesting to find about that. Although I'm going to be honest, there weren't really a whole lot of sources that I could see in relations to Henry Gantt. But that kind of made my noggin jog a little bit for, you know, socializing industrial production. I don't know. That was a fascinating one. And then, of course, um, the other thing is, is Henry Gantt is listed under Stevens Institute of Technology Alumni. And the American Society of Mechanical Engineers published his biography in 1934 and awarded an annual medal in honor of Henry Lawrence Gantt. And, yeah, there you go. Now we've talked about the guy who invented the Gantt charts that we use now today, which... You have to think about the timing of all this, too, because what was happening after all that, the Manhattan Project? And one of the things about the Manhattan Project, it is quite a project management feat, I will definitely say. And it definitely incorporated a lot of project management concepts including gantt charts so the fact of the matter is is that while all this is starting to come about during that same time you had all this scientific research happening as well and then of course leading into the manhattan project which we get the nuclear bombs 
So he was a pretty interesting character, but the other person that I kept seeing with his picture, as I mentioned before, um, he was more into the scientific management um, concept that he applied as well. And as I said, that may be a potential topic because it was really interesting to see that come up because I will be honest and even going to business school, I've never really heard of scientific management. But if someone else has, I'd be happy to hear your opinion about it in the comments or you can send a message via Twitter, whatever the case may be. So now that we've talked about at least one person who's contributed to project management, we now get to talk about project management as a whole. So now that we've talked about Henry Gantt, the inventor of the Gantt chart and the father of planning, we're now going to talk about the history of project management as a whole and sprinkle in a little bit about the history of the Project Management Institute, also known as PMI, who holds the PMP certification. Until the 1900s, civil engineering projects were generally managed by creative architects, engineers, and master builders themselves. As a discipline, project management developed from several fields of application, including civil construction, engineering, and heavy defense activity. Now, in talking about the history of project management, when we think about the quote unquote traditional project management that's ever mentioned in the field and also sometimes in teaching, we think of construction and or manufacturing facilities, right? Because the thing is, is that by understanding definition of the traditional project management or the predictive is that you need to predict everything you need and everything that has to be done in order to do it, which is really easy to do if you've built you know, 50 houses or built 10 hundred widgets, right? It just depends on the project, right? Now, this is all before the concept of agile. But as we're going to continue to learn, agile was kind of there, but not really as being called agile. So, of course, the field of project management emerged during this time and further solidified after World War II. That's after the Manhattan Project, right? As we know, Manhattan Project was a huge success for the government. It was a huge success overall. And if you watched my previous podcast about it, you would know that it was a lot of efforts. There were multiple um, efforts happening at the same time, making everything parallel, etc., so after World War II, when the focus on rebuilding and strengthening the economy became a thing, so in the 1950s, government agencies and companies realized the important role project management played in keeping workers motivated and productive. In fact, a project management system in 1956 for militaries um, projects is still relevant and used today. Lockheed Martin um, a while back was tasked by the U.S. Navy to mount tactical missiles on submarines, and Lockheed Martin hired management consultant group Booz Allen Hamilton to help accomplish this project. The project management system used to build the missiles was called the Program Evaluation and Review Technique, also known as PERT, a graphical chart that displays a project schedule. Now, there's a Slight difference between the Gantt chart that was invented by Henry Gantt and the PERT graphical chart. Um, one's more based on statistics, whereas the other's more on activities and duration. So that's kind of the only difference, but they both do the same thing. They both show the logical flow of how the activities are to be done, when they're supposed to be done, and all that. But one's more about the review of the technique, whereas the other's kind of showing in a graphical timeline where things are in terms of progress. And of course, the 1950s marked the beginning of a modern project management era where core engineering fields came together to work as one. Project management became recognized as a distinct discipline arising from management discipline with the engineering model. In the United States, prior to the 1950s, projects were managed on an ad hoc basis. 
And this is where the Manhattan Project is a unique situation. Okay. And then we talked a, a lot about different projects. We really have. But the Manhattan Project is very unique because as we're hearing this and learning this information together, it was one of those exceptions to the rule, right? And we think about a lot of other projects even before, like the Great Pyramids, um, the Great Wall of China, you know, things like that. And we always wonder, like, man, how did people do it, right? Well, they used project management. They just didn't know what it was or they didn't really have a name for it, right? And so that's why the Manhattan Project, again, holds such a huge significance, not only from a historical standpoint for a change in World War II, um, it's also the discovery of nuclear energy, and it is also a pinnacle project of showing that these techniques that we use in project management are crucial and very important. And that's why it, it is pretty much the springboard into what we know project management today. So at the time, two mathematical project scheduling models were developed, the critical path method, which is what we talk about in the PMBOK. This is where we're conducting the forward pass and the backwards pass to understand the float of all the tasks and to identify your critical path, which is the longest path from beginning to end of your project. As a joint venture between DuPont Corporation and Remington Rand Corporation for managing plant maintenance projects, and the program evaluation and review technique was developed by the U.S. Navy Special Projects Office in conjunction with Lockheed Martin Corporation and Booz Allen Hamilton as part of the Polaris Missile Submarine Program. So, as I was kind of mentioning earlier, um, so you have the critical path method, which is conducting an analysis using the forward and backward pass to calculate the float or slack. By doing this, you, as the project manager, identify the critical path. That's the whole point of critical path method. And then the PERT method, it conducts analysis through three-point estimating, which is identifying your optimistic point, your pessimistic point, and your most likely data points to determine the overall time it will take to complete the project. So the thing about the PERT analysis and the three-point estimating is that then you use a formula. So there's the standard um, deviation and then there's the it's not deviation but it's the standard formula and the beta formula which the beta formula I've, as I noticed in the real world tends to be used a lot more than just the standard but basically what the formula does is it takes pessimistic plus most likely plus optimistic divided by three for standard and then for beta it is pessimistic plus four times most likely plus optimistic divided by six, which gives it a little bit more of a weighted average. I don't know what other um, formula does the same, a same or similar thing, but I can't recall off the top of my head. So here's the thing. The main difference is that the PERT is a visual technique. It helps project managers plan, schedule, and control tasks, also referred to as activities. And critical path method is a statistical technique that is used to plan and schedule uh, and control. However, it uses well-defined tasks to do so. So when one's kind of more about estimation, the other one is more about well-defined tasks. Although if we were to be perfectly frank and honest with ourselves, uh, in the real world, we tend to use, you know, re, you know, well-defined tasks in the first place. Why? Because it's not good practice to not use well-defined activities because then kind of spitballing unless of course you're creating like a rom which is a rough order magnitude which at that point you're just really like guessing right as i'm simplifying that but you're really guessing for a rom but if you were to really understand how much time it may take for an activity to get done and potentially identifying your critical path or in the schedule management right developing your schedule you're going to have to have really defined tasks. Now, does that mean the whole schedule needs to have all the tasks defined? No, that's not what that means. It means you can go up to a certain point if you're using like progressive elaboration, for example, which is another way of being quote unquote agile, right? Where you are only pretty much clearly breaking down items that you know today you can definitely answer to versus items you can't answer to because they're far in the future. Which this leads us to the history of the PMI Institute, 
which comes much later. And I didn't get too deep into it because pretty much afterwards, it's the same stuff. It's like them talking about the PMP and all those other things. But what's interesting is so after months of conversation between Jim Snyder and Gordon Davis, a 1969 dinner in Philadelphia resulted in a decision that a new organization should be formed to provide a means for project managers to associate, share information, and discuss common problems. This led to the first formal meeting at Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia, on October 9th, 1969. From this meeting came the birth of the Project Management Institute. Shortly thereafter, articles of incorporation were filed in Pennsylvania, signed by five persons who are officially recognized as the founders of PMI, which is James Snyder, Eric Jeanette, Gordon Davis, E.A. Ned Eggman, and Susan G. Gallagher. And of course, between the years 1969 and 1979, which what was happening in 1969 forward? The Apollo Space Program. And this is actually found on the Project Management Institute's website, which I kind of found really cool because, again, the Apollo Space Program had a lot going on. I mean, we were talking about some of that, right? We were talking about, you know, the Apollo 1. We talk, We will eventually probably talk about Apollo 11, Apollo 13. You had the ESA 201 through 203, which were on man. You had all this going on. So, of course, they call it the one giant leap for project management, right? Because in Apollo 11, it was when they landed on the moon, one giant leap for mankind. So... It was really cool that they wrote that. But of course, um, PMI started making strides in establishing project management body of best practices. And so PMI was founded in Helen's first seminars and symposiums on advanced project management concepts in Atlanta, Georgia, USA. The first PMI chapter is started in Houston, Texas, and PMI quickly became global, holding another seminar symposium in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And then PMI also hired its first time, first part-time employee and leased office space, which is really cool. Um, because again, we get to see what's going on with the Apollo space program. We, we had all these other projects going on too. Um, you had missions. It, it, it's really cool to see that. But of course, I'm sure you are all wondering this very question, which is why are we learning about the history of project management? Well, like anything else, it is important to understand where things come from, where are their beginnings, why did they start, right? It's like not learning about, as I've mentioned over and over, not learning about the Manhattan Project. It's like not going to your history class and learning about how the world began um, in terms of civilization, or going to a biology class to understand at a molecular level how life began right and as it's always phrased if we never if we don't learn from history we tend to repeat itself right we tend to repeat the history and it's important to learn about these different projects which is why as you see we're learning about all these different programs these projects both successful and unsuccessful so that we can better understand what did people do differently Overall, if you were to really think about it, lessons learned is your history. It's like learning your hi uh, history of the United States of America or China or Europe or Africa. It's the same thing for project management. Where did it come from? Why did it come? Why was it this? Why was it that? And at the end of the day, it helps you become a much more well-rounded PM at the end of the day. And that's why it's important to not only understand the concepts, right? Because we've constantly gone over concepts after concept after concept, except for, you know, Ocean Gate, that was a little bit more of an opinion. But we have to also understand the history of where project management came from. And so with that said, I really appreciate you all joining me today on the history of project management and learning about Henry Gantt, and I will see you in the next video. Mm -hmm.